Okay, well, well, here we are. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We're in the second part of this Bible study in Revelation chapters 12 through 14. And we have still a few people are on their way, so we're going to go ahead and review a little bit of some of the things that we talked about last week, where we've been. And one of the things that I want to remind you of is we're in the third interlude. This is not a linear thing that John's doing. We got to the sixth trumpet, ready for the seventh trumpet, and when the seventh trumpet blew, there were no plagues, there was nothing going on. We're getting these stories about what's happening. We first we had the second interlude, which was the angel and the scroll, and John being uh, the prophet. And then this third interlude, which is chapters 12 through 14, is the ultimate battle between good and evil, the church versus evil specifically. And we met a being, an individual, back in Revelation chapter 11, 7, is the one that killed the witnesses, and that's, that, that individual, that system, that, that person is called the beast. Okay? Um, and then last week, as we were in chapter 12, 1 through 6, we saw the ultimate battle, the continual battle of Satan trying to destroy both Christ or the Messiah and the church. Uh, we saw a picture of a pregnant woman, which was the heavenly representation of the church, with the dragon waiting there for the baby to the, something to be birthed so that it could devour it. Uh, we've seen that two times in that cha- in those first six verses of chapter 12, there was deliverance. Um, first one, of course, we know was when the angel told Joseph to take Mary and, and Jesus to Egypt to to avoid being murdered by Herod. Also, then we know that when Jesus hung on the cross and died on the cross, that he defeated um, Satan and he snatched victory from the jaws of the dragon. And we kind of talked about that a little bit this morning when I referenced Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which was the very first time in the Bible where it mentions this battle. And it's talking about the curse on on the serpent who caused the, the temptation for Adam and Eve to sin. And... God said in that conversation that the seed of woman would defeat the serpent, which is also the dragon, which is also Satan, um, and that he would, Satan would bruise his heel, but that the son of man would crush Satan's head. And so we know that when Jesus won victory on the cross, that Satan's defeated. Well, he's defeated, but he's not vanquished. He's not put away where he can't do anything. He's limited. He's always been limited. Why? Why has he always been limited? Because he's a created being. He's not equal with God. We want to establish that and make sure everybody knows that, that he is not equal to God. He is not God's peer. He was created by God. He was the most beautiful being that God ever created. His pride got the best of him. We read about that in Isaiah chapter 14. And that he led rebellion in heaven and that the angels followed him because of his pride. And he always... Always, for some reason or another, that's his first go-to when he is tempting somebody or when evil is tempting something. Pride seems to be our weakest link as human beings, doesn't it? Would you say pride's our weakest link? Yeah. Absolutely it is. Um, and that's why this morning as we were talking about Jesus going through what he went through, all through those illegal trials, standing before, standing before Pilate, also, while he's being whipped and beaten and flogged and mocked and ridiculed and spit on and all that kind of stuff, he was humble. He was humble. And when he hung on the cross, every slur and every slander that was hurled at him was hurled at his pride. Wasn't it? Oh, he says he's the king of the Jews. Oh, he can save people he can't save himself. Oh, if he's the Messiah, let him come on down off that cross. All those kind of things to try to cause him to not do what he came to do. Um, and somebody would say, well, he was God, and he had to do what he came to do. But he was also man at the same time. And no matter how much we try to live for God, there's still that piece of us in there that can be tempted by pride and can be caused to do things like outbursts of anger and things like that because our pride is damaged, our feelings are hurt, however you want to put it. We still have that ability. Jesus did it. He gave us the perfect example of what it looked like. And we know that Satan tried to destroy Christ, and he is trying and continues to try to destroy the church. But there's always going to be a remnant. God always provides protection, and there will always be a remnant of people left. 
Okay? A remnant of true believers. Not everybody who names the name of Christ is a follower of Christ. Just like everybody, Paul said, not everybody who's born a Jew is a Jew. Uh, everybody who follows Christ follows Christ by choice, and there is evidence in the life of somebody who's truly following Christ. And there's evidence in the, in the life of somebody who's not following Christ so that people know they're not following Christ. Okay? Because people can only be good for so long. Or if somebody constantly has a negative approach and wants to fight against everything that sounds like it's against what God wants or wants to have some kind of an opinion that's counterproductive to getting God's work done, you have to decide in your mind whether or not they really are a believer. And somebody would say, you can't judge. No, God ultimately judges. Jesus said people judge themselves in John 3, 17 to 21. He said whenever they choose against him, they choose to be separated from God for eternity. But the Bible tells us that we're supposed to look at people and judge the fruit of their life. Okay? Um, and that's why I'm saying, and why I've said all this, when, when we started seeing things start getting really bad in the Revelation, as we started looking through it so far, as we've seen what's happened, there are going to be a lot of people who jump ship. There are going to be a lot of people who bail. And as we go into these next little bit of scripture that we're going through until we get to the end of chapter 14, when the beast arrives on the scene, and we find out what that's all about, that's the Antichrist, when we find out the false prophets there, when we talk about exchanging and doing business and commerce during this time, there are a lot of people who are just going to bail on God. They're going to deny they knew him just like Peter did, and if you can do that, you never knew him in the first place right now, okay? Uh, because salvation didn't come until Jesus died on the cross. So Peter was following Jesus as a Jew looking for a Messiah. He didn't understand the salvation power of the cross. And there are a lot of people who have adopted the idea of, I want to be a Christian, or I think Christians are okay people, but there are not a lot of people who have determined, I'm going to live my life for Christ no matter what it costs. Because it costs something, doesn't it? What's it cost? It can cost you your family. It can cost you your job. It can cost you all your friends. Uh, because once you start living for God and loving God and understanding who God is, people don't want to be around that. And it's an amazing thing. You know, it's not that you're driving them away. It's just that when they're around you and you begin to be the person that God wants you to be, the Holy Spirit is speaking in an inaudible voice to them and they have to compare themselves to what you were and who you are, and then they got to decide, am I willing to be a part of this? And the thing is, the sinful nature has never done what God wants, and it never will. It's only those who surrender their life to Christ and taken on the nature of Christ who can do what God wants. All right, well, I'm going to pass out the notes for tonight because I just saw them pulling the parking lot. Um, go ahead and pass those down there. Get the Holy One. Make sure you leave two down there for them. Um, and... We're going to jump in, starting in verse 7 of Re Revelation chapter 12. So we're going to move over here and put 12, 7, and following. And we're going to see what happens as this interlude continues to unfold. Okay? Um, we've just seen Satan's attempts to destroy the Messiah and the church in these chapter, in chapter 12, 1 through 6. And John's vision shifts to a different battle, all right? John has been giving us this whole thing from different perspectives. First he's on earth, then he's in heaven, then he's back on earth, then he's back in heaven. Now he's back on earth looking into heaven, and he's going to see this battle taking place, and he sees the battle taking place, he's going to reveal what he sees to us. And again, as you've heard me say, a lot of the stuff that John is describing has already taken place, all right? Satan trying to stop Jesus from being born, trying to stop the church, continuing to try to stop the church. That is continually going on through history. God's protection is constantly there for the church. There's always going to be somebody left to follow Christ because they won't give up and God's not going to let them be destroyed. And so John is looking into heaven. This John's vision shifts to a different battle as he stands on earth and looks into heaven. So in chapters uh, 12, 7 through, or 7 through 12, we're going to see a war that takes place here in heaven. All right? Let's read down through that. Revelation chapter 7, um, verses 7 through 12. I better get myself a pair of eyeballs here so I can see what I'm doing. I'm wearing my contacts tonight, and these old man eyes don't want to always cooperate with me. So we're going to 
read this, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit. All right. Then there was a war. In, oh, let's back up again. What, what, what did we see in, in chapter 12, verse 6 that we've seen several places already in the book of Revelation? 1260 days, right? Yeah. It's a period of time. That's what we're looking at it as, a period of time. It's not necessarily just three and a half literal years. It's not 1260 literal days. It's not time, times, and half time. It is a, a specific amount of time that God's allotted. Okay? It's not specifically three and a half years. Because if it's specifically three and a half years, when we read the description of Satan, what's he got to be? A big red dragon. Is Satan a big red dragon? No. no, he's not. He's the most beautiful angel that God ever created. John is using apocalyptic language to describe what's going on. All right? He doesn't have a calendar there with 1260 days marked off. He's really channeling Daniel. Remember, Daniel gave time, time, and half time, and he gave 1260 days. But also 69 weeks and 70 weeks and it's been way more than 69 weeks or 70 weeks since Daniel was around because that was almost 3,000 years ago, right? Everybody understand that? So as we look at this, we got to remember, this is apocalyptic writing. John's writing some of it in code so people know what it is, and we can't literally interpret some things and then figuratively, figuratively interpret some other things because we don't have the license to do that. We weren't in the first century. We don't know what's going on, but we do know that John's offering hope to a group of people in these churches that's under persecution by the Jews and by the Roman government, and he is trying to give them what they need to know, and that God will protect them, and God's going to watch over them, and God's going to keep them, even though it may cost them their lives. Okay? And really, so then what's he doing? He's just expanding Jesus' <clears throat> talk about how in order to really be my follower, you have to be willing to lay down your life for me. You've got to be willing to give it all up. You've got to be willing to die if you're truly going to be my follower. All right, here we go. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and his angels were for and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they have defeated him by the power, uh, by the blood of the Lamb and the power of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. Again, little time, a period of time. And this, you know, this 1260-day thing is a period of time, a small amount of time. It's not thousands of years. It's not hundreds of years. It's a short, limited amount of time. So let's go into this a little bit. Verses 7 through 9. Satan and his angels are defeated in heaven by Michael and the armies of heaven. Well, who are the armies of heaven? Who is Michael? An angel. Michael's an archangel. How do we know that Michael's an archangel? How do we know that he's an angel? Where else do you find Michael, or Michael in the Bible? Does anybody know? Hmm? You find him in Daniel? Because Daniel's praying for like two and a half weeks and he doesn't get an answer and he's fasting and he's praying and all of a sudden Michael shows up and said... God heard your prayer as soon as you asked. I've been fighting my way here against the prince of the power of this world. Okay, who is that? Satan. So you have two equal powers fighting each other. You have Michael fighting Satan. Now, if we're reading it in Revelation that there was a war in heaven between Michael and Satan, that could go all the way back to the time of Daniel. But it could even go all the way back further than that because Satan was already in existence before the Garden of Eden, Right? And he was already on earth as the serpent, correct? In the Garden of Eden, who tempted Adam and Eve. So we're looking at history, and we're looking at present. We're looking at all kinds of things going on here. Well, actually, John wrote this, what, 2,000 years ago, 
Okay? And as we see this, Satan and his angels are defeated, and then in verse 7, Satan attempts a coup over God. Look at this. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Why in the world would there be a battle in heaven in the first place? Well, we read it in Isaiah, didn't we? Satan wanted to take over, and he wanted to be God. He wanted to put himself in God's place, because he thought he was equal to God. Was he equal to God? No. No. And this coup that's going on, he's defeated, okay? Satan is defeated and cast out of heaven. Look with me at Jude 9. Now, if you ask me what chapter, I'm going to tell you you never read Jude before. Jude 9, right? Jude's only one chapter long. Jude 9. Even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, um, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. When does that go back to? Right before the Israelites went into the promised land. Okay, so there's always been contention between the archangel Michael and the archangel Lucifer. Satan was already on the evil side. We know that because he wanted to destroy the body of Moses. But they have equal power. No. Well, they're both angels. They're both archangels. So they have equal power. Yeah, pretty much. There's only three of them <coughs> in the real Bible. Now, you can look at apocryphal books in the Catholic Bible, those ten books that are in the middle between the New Testament and the Old Testament, and they try to introduce us to several other ones. But there's only Michael, who is the soldier angel. And then there's Gabriel, who's the messenger angel, because Gabriel's the one that came to Mary and came to Joseph, right? And then we have Lucifer, which is the most beautiful angel God ever created. Okay, he was called the son of the morning. Up to this point, Satan still has access to God's presence. Up to this point where this battle occurs, and Satan is cast down from heaven with those angels. Well, as long as I've been on the earth, I've been knowing that Satan, Satan's been on this earth and there's been, there's been his, his demons, his angels turned demons, who are here because Paul talks to us about it in Ephesians chapter 6, doesn't he? When he tells us to put on the full armor of God. It's to fight against the powers of darkness that are already in the world. So this is history. Satan is cast down a long, long time ago. Okay? And if we look at this in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, it says, There was a time when the sons of God came before God's throne, and God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's not a righteous man like him on the earth. And what was Satan's response? Only because you protect him. Only because you protect him, I guarantee if you take your hand off his life, I can make him curse you. And God says, Okay, I'll make you a bet. Just can't do this, this, and this. Okay? You can do whatever you want, but not this. And then in chapter 2, he comes back again. He says, hey, have you heard about my servant Job? Well, you know, if you let me affect his life and affect his health and things like that, I know he's surely blaspheming. And what happened? Job didn't do it. He didn't do it. So Satan still had access to God at that point. Then we look at Zechariah chapter 3. That's in the Old Testament there. We've already been in, in Zechariah as we looked at the all of trees and the candlesticks and all that kind of stuff. So let's look at Zechariah real quick. Chapter 3. Right there before Malachi. that there was an argument there for the cleansing of the high priest at that time 
And Jeshua was the guy who was chosen by God. And as soon as he's chosen by God, who's there accusing him? Who's there saying, oh, but he's a dirty, rotten snook. Oh, but look at his. Look, you don't know it. If you really knew him, you wouldn't let him be that guy. Okay? So there's been dialogue going on between Satan and God all along. And then we learn, turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. This word says, yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus said that. So he knows that Satan's been cast down. He's telling them Satan's been cast down. But he says, look here, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy so that you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. So what happens is this. When we have Christ in our lives, we have authority over those powers that are out there. But I'm going to guarantee you what. You better make sure if you encounter anything like that in your life, and it really does exist, you better make sure that you're fine with God, right where you need to be with God. I've been in a couple of those situations in my life. One was in Colorado. Um, and let me tell you, when you're around somebody and they haven't been drinking and all of a sudden you're in the room with them and you start praying with them and things start coming out of their mouth and it, sound, it smells like somebody's puking alcohol everywhere in the room and all kinds of stuff like that's going on, you better make sure you're okay with God when you encounter something like that. You better. It's real. It's not like the Exorcist movies on TV, I promise you that. But it's pretty spooky. Okay? And so we see Jesus talk about Satan being cast down. And then Ephesians chapter 2. We'll look there real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Says... Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So Satan is in the earth working all the time to draw people away from God. Okay? Now, the way that the, 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 way that the Jews looked at it in the Old Testament is this. Just to give you a little perspective. Alright? They looked at Paul said, I was taken up to the third level of heaven. All right? If you remember that when, when he was talking about the vision that he has. And uh, so we have the earth, and then everything from the earth to the clouds is the second level of heaven, or the, the first level of heaven, and everything from the clouds to the sky, as far as you can see, would be the third level of heaven, or second level of heaven, and the third level of heaven is where God abides. So when it says that Satan was cast down, the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. Okay? So it's not like Satan's in a hole under the ground. Satan is not, hell is not a hole under the ground. It's not. Okay? Hell is like I said, I think heaven is. Remember when I talked to you about heaven just being one step out of what we can see? In a little different dimension. It's not like it's way off out in some other galaxy. Have you seen the new commercial or whatever where NASA has found where two galaxies collided with each other and they pass through each other? Now, let me tell you what. It takes a pretty speculative, great imagination to look at a picture from a telescope and say two galaxies hit each other and that's what it looks like. Okay? But God doesn't live light years away from us. God exists outside of time. And if we were just one split second outside of time, we wouldn't be interacting at the same point in this room. Okay? Hell is the same way. Except where heaven is people who are absolutely with God in that place of outside of our time. Hell is also a place where God has abandoned people who denied him and they can't get to God and they can't get to here and they can't get to anybody that they care for or love and that's part of the punishment of hell, is not being able. If you remember when the rich man was in hell and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, he wanted Lazarus to go tell his brothers, you don't want to come here. And what did Abraham say? No. They have the law and the prophets. They can read it for themselves. If they don't hear it from God that way and they don't believe it, even they wouldn't believe it if the dead person came back. So this morning as we were talking about those people saying if Jesus was the Messiah, he should bring himself down off the cross. They, didn't ever, they still wouldn't have believed him. Because after he resurrected from the dead, they surely didn't believe him, did they? No. 
So Satan always has a way to corrupt things. Satan always has a way to make things happen that go against what God wants. Let's look at verse 9. Or verse 8, the dragon lost the battle, and he as his angels were forced out of heaven. That would be a third of the angels, because it says, when the dragon fell, a third of the stars fell, right? So that would be a third of them. This great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth with all his angels. You see this called, not God's angels, they're his angels, okay? Now, somebody would say, can angels still sin? No. For somehow or other, only those who followed Satan, followed Satan. Nobody's breaking off still, okay? Um, when you see movies like the one that Keanu Reeves was in called uh, Constantine, no angels still fallen. All the ones who rebelled are fallen, and the ones who aren't rebelled know what's going to happen to those, and somehow or another there's uh, something in place that keeps them from rebelling. So one third of all the angels. And in the Old Testament, or in the, in the Bible, in the King James, it calls it myriads and myriads. And if you look at the New Translation, it talks about millions and billions of angels. Okay, So that's not a small amount. And that's why we can't say Satan is tempting everybody. Satan can only tempt one person at a time. Because he is not <coughs> omnipresent. He's like us. He can only be in one place at a time. Because when God asked him about Job, he said, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. He is looking for somebody to tempt, looking for something to do. But there are enough, enough demonic beings who were formerly angel beings, other than the ones that are already locked up in the abyss and the ones that are locked up in other places that we've read about. There are enough of them still loose that they wreak havoc on our world, don't they? And here's the amazing thing. If they can reach a powerful enough person, they can reach a lot of people. But they're also what they call, the Bible calls familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are people that hang around you. And that's why Christian people sometimes say, well, I, my grandma died, or my mom died, or my dad died, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I up at the bottom of the bed near the wire. Well, let me tell you what, that's a nightmare. Or it is a familiar spirit trying to impersonate somebody to cause you to doubt God and believe that something else is real. And there's no in-between. There's no in-between. You're either here or you're on heaven, or in heaven or you're in, the, in hell. That's the only three places you can be. And you can only be in one at a time. So once we're done here, to be absent from the body, to be present with Christ for believers, once we die, if we, have no, if we don't have Christ, it's hell immediately, which is the holy place for those who are going to end up ultimately in the lake of fire because their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is that helpful to give you guys all that perspective? I mean, we really haven't gotten into this yet, but Satan has been thrown down for a long time. He was actually defeated at the cross. Totally, completely defeated. Okay? But he was thrown down from heaven a long time ago. So this is not something that's going to happen in the future. It's already happened. He's already thrown down. Okay? Now, as we look at uh, chapter... Or verse 9, Satan and his fallen angels are cast down to earth. Satan and his fallen angels are cast down to earth. And this victory, was what I just said the last sentence ago, was established at the cross. Okay? When Jesus said, it is finished, death and hell were defeated. When he rose from the grave, the grave was defeated. So that's why it says that he has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He defeated all of them. But he didn't defeat the grave until he rose from the dead. All right? But he defeated hell. He defeated all the powers of hell and what they had planned. Satan and the powers under him are the chief foes of God's people on the earth. We don't struggle against flesh and blood. Keep that in your mind. Every time it seems like you're fighting against a person, realize that somehow or another, evil influence is in the middle of that. Okay? They are either being influenced by evil, or they've turned themselves over to evil, or you put off your Christ-like nature and put back on your old sin nature. It's not always them. Does that make sense to everybody? And the devil didn't make you do it. The devil can't make you do anything. He can't. If God gives us a free will and doesn't force us to follow him, 
Satan is not as powerful as God. He can't make us do anything. But he can present all the opportunities that he wants to to see if we'll bite. Won't he? Okay? What's the best thing to do? Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, put off all rage and anger and outbursts of anger. Don't slander your neighbor, all those things the Bible says, you know, make sure that you're living the way God wants you to live. And we have the power, because Jesus won the victory, to say, get behind me, Satan, just like Jesus said to Peter when Peter was doing Satan's work. And we, the Bible tells us that if we resist, he has to flee. <clears throat> he has to flee. Okay? So Satan is powerful, but because we have Christ in our lives, he's not powerful enough to destroy us. Now, again, we see here that people are going to die. And we saw in chapter 6 where there were martyrs under the altar calling out to God. He can, kill, he can cause people's death. But it can't destroy us. Because once this body is gone, this body is the husk. This is the earthly representation of who we are. It is not who we are. Who we are is our soul and our spirit. Okay? Our spirit is our mind. And our body and our mind are not the same thing. And our soul is eternal. And when our soul and our, body and our spirit are set free from these bodies, both of them go to be with Christ. That's how we'll recognize each other and we'll know each other. Well, it's not like we're going to have a, a blank slate, a tabula rasa, where all of our things, every memory is going to be erased and we're not going to know anything. But when we are reunited in our new body, if we have already dead, or we, our bodies are changed in the twinkling of an eye, as it says, we will still know who we are. So we're body, soul, and spirit. And Satan can destroy my body, but he can't hurt me. Because I am not my body. My body contains me. Does that make sense to everybody? This is the representation of me physically. Physical. But I don't look like this soul and spirit. It's totally different. Okay? That's why we're eternal beings. And people who believe that you just are born into this world and you live and you die and you're just, you stop. No, not at all. Because Jesus would have never had to come down on the cross if there wasn't an eternal part of us that needed to be fixed so that we could spend eternity with God. Okay? So anybody that believes that we're just born and we die and there's nothing else, they have no idea of the innate value of um, and the sacred value that God's placed on every human life. And every woman who has used abortion as a platform for birth control has sent a soul and a spirit on to heaven. Because it wasn't just a body, it wasn't just a normal flesh, it was a body, it was a human. And that human contained the spirit and the soul before it was ever born. And so we forget about the sanctity of life. You know, when they start talking about eugenics and euthanizing older people who have no value anymore, won't give surgeries to people that don't have life expectancy and things like that. Um, you know, I'm reminded of the movie Soylent Green, if anybody's ever seen Soylent Green. You know, where Charlton Heston's in there and Edgar G. Robinson and, and Edgar G. Robinson's this old man. Once you hit 70 years old, in that movie, you went to this room and they fed you this big feast, whatever you wanted to eat. Then you laid down on the table and they played this really nicey, nicey music and they stuck a needle in your arm and they gave you a shot that caused you to just wink out. Okay? Well, what they didn't know was they were grinding that up and feeding it to people. Soil and green was people. So, you know, we have more value than that. We do. And that's why you know, when it says in Revelation chapter 11, death gave up its dead, hell gave up its dead, the sea gave up its dead. Most people who die in the ocean go through every critter from the top of the food chain all the way down to the ones that pick the pieces up off the bottom. God's able to take all that molecular structure and put it back together to make a house, a tent for the soul and the spirit. Okay? So Satan wants to destroy us. 
He knows he can't destroy our souls if we belong to Christ, but he will do everything he can to try to destroy us in other ways. And he's been doing that for a long time. And there's been a constant battle between good and evil, and we're talking, we talked about that right here. The, the, the battle between Satan and the church and Satan and what's going on. So, one more place, we well, can, can read the armor of God there in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, when you get a chance to read that. It goes along with what we were just talking about. Now, as we look at verses 10 through 12, we're getting a dramatic flashback. We're also seeing, again, worship in heaven, which is what we saw back when the 24 elders were leading worship before. Let's read that. It says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accusers of our brother and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Okay? Satan means adversary or accuser. Satan and the word Satan and the word devil mean adversary and accuser, okay? And so he's saying here the accuser of the brethren. So Satan is the accuser of the brethren. When they say that, when it says devil, it's the adversary of those who belong to God. So he's not only our accuser, he's our adversary. And he's here, and he's working. And he has lots of troops working for him, and he has human beings working for him. Anybody that buys into Wicca, anybody that buys into... Any other religion other than Christianity? Anybody that buys into atheism and evolutionism and all those kind of things, all those religions? Anybody that buys into wokeism, which is a new religion that's on the world? Um, you know, the whole CRT equity thing, that's a new religion that's on the world. They've got their own high priests, they've got their own teachers, they've got their own leaders, they've got their own prophets of what's going to be. It's all religion. Um, it might not be listed on, as a religion in the book of religions, but it's religion. It's their religion, it's their rejection of who God is and what God wants. And even atheists are religion. Atheism is a religion. Okay? Anybody that doesn't belong to God belongs to Him. Anybody that lives a life of constant habitual sin proves that they don't belong to God, but they belong to their father, the devil, who's been sinning since the world began. Okay? And so as we look at this, this thing that we're seeing in the book of Revelation, which everybody wants to put way off into history, off into the future, they've already done the celebration. Satan's already defeated. The accuser of the brother is defeated. Remember what we said last week about when Jesus came to earth and he started preaching, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. He established the kingdom of God here on earth partially. When he died on the cross, it opened it up more. And one day when he comes back, He's going to fully establish his kingdom. So we live in the now, but not yet. So when Jesus died on the cross, he was thrown to Satan was defeated. Okay? Defeated. Let's look at this. Christ, the triumphant lamb, has defeated the dragon in a battle of cosmic proportions. Now, we see that Michael was fighting against Satan. And now we know that Jesus defeated Satan. So did Michael defeat Satan, or did Jesus defeat Satan? Well, we're not done with that question yet. We're going to go just a little mm -hmm. bit further. Of course, the accuser of the brother has been defeated. But look at verse 11. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Who's that talking about? Yes. Martyrs. Martyrs, okay? A martyr is someone who gives their life for a cause, correct? I mean, there can be martyrs for every cause. Uh, I was watching The Gladiator the other day with Russell Crowe. Has anybody seen that one? Where he's falsely imprisoned and, and uh, River Phoenix is the, the new Roman Empire who killed, uh, emperor who killed his dad who was the previous emperor who wanted to make Russell Crowe, the guy who was in charge, Maximus was his name, and he didn't want his son to have it, so the uh, River Phoenix, well, I forget, Commodus was his name, killed uh, Marcus Aurelius and imprisoned Maximus because he wanted things his way. That's what happens, right? When we see how evil works in the world, but 
when they put him in the gladiator ring, when they put Russell Crowe in the gladiator ring, the, the new Roman Empire emperor said, just go out there and kill him. And his, all his generals were saying, no, then you make a martyr out of him. And then that makes your position even more tenuous. So anybody that gives their life for a cause, especially those who give themselves for the cause of Christ, are considered martyrs. And how was Satan defeated? Look at what it says. It says, by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. How is Satan defeated in our world today in everyday battles? By the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony, right? By our walk with Christ, by our willingness to struggle and live for Christ. And so they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So the martyrs have also, in a sense, defeated the evil by their testimony. That's verse 11 there, the martyrs. They're witness to the saving power of Jesus, um, and they are overcomers. Look at Matthew 24, 9 through 14. So we have Michael doing battle. Here's the battle. We have Michael in it. We have Christ in it. And we have believers in the battle. Well, doesn't that make Satan seem like he's a pretty powerful opponent? Well, Michael fought against the angels in heaven. Jesus defeated Satan on earth, and he gives us the power to overcome Satan every day. So the battle was fought, the battle was won, but the battle still continues to go on. Does that make sense to everybody? Just because a battle is won doesn't mean the war stops. Anybody that's ever read any of the history of the wars of the world, and I don't mean the alien war of the worlds, I mean anybody that's read any of the history of any of the wars in the world, sometimes great battles are lost, but the war can still be won by an accumulation of small battles. If you want to, know, if you want to hear how that works, you read the history of the Revolutionary War in the United States. The Americans were beat at every major battle. Do you know how they won the war? They won all the small battles. And once they won all the small battles, they got the courage to fight one last battle when Cornwallis gave up his sword and they all, the English left. But they lost every big battle. They lost every major battle. I mean, they had people deserting right and left because they thought it was a worthless cause. But George Washington was a strong enough man to lead them and he had good enough people under him to lead them to continue to fight the small battles. And every time they won a small battle, then they won another small battle. They beat a bunch of uh, British, they beat a bunch of British, they beat a bunch of British. Next thing you know, we win. And see what happens. Michael and his angels defeated Satan and his angels as they were trying to cause the coup in heaven. Jesus put the final nail in the coffin for Satan when he beat him at the cross. And then as believers, we still fight the battle between our sin nature and between the powers of evil that are going on in the world today. Okay, this is not something that's way out there. It's already happened, it's happening now, and it's going to continue to happen all the way up to the end. I missed the blank. Right there beside... Um, right below, verse, a dramatic flashback, the blank of... The meaning of the cross of Christ. Verse 10 was the meaning of the cross of Christ. Um... It's come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God, the authority of Christ. That's where Jesus established his kingdom and his authority when he died and rose again. Okay? All right, let's keep going here. Verse 12, we see we rejoicing and terror. Rejoicing and terror. How can you have rejoicing and terror at the same time? Hmm? That's when a teenager gets their driver's license and they're going, yeah! And their parents are going, ah! Right? Rejoicing and terror. You didn't know all about that. You just had that happen in your house. Right? Rejoicing and terror. Sometimes they happen at the same time. Watch this. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice, but terror will come on the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing what? That he has a little bit of time. Well, this was written 2,000 years ago. That's a long time ago, isn't it? But in the scope of eternity, it's nothing. 
It's not a it's not a, a wink of an eye in the sphere of eternity. Satan's been around for a long, long time. He did what he did before man was even created. Okay? He rebelled against God before man was even created. Well, let's look at this. Uh, there's great rejoicing in heaven at the defeat of Satan in answer to the question from chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, which was what? How long, O Lord? How long before you bring justice to us? And who said that? Does anybody remember? We already mentioned it tonight. The martyrs who were under the altar. Right? How long? Well, the answer is, it's done. In a short time, it's going to be done. Everything's going to be finished up. Also, Satan is overthrown, but not completely destroyed. Because if evil was destroyed, and he is the personification of evil, there wouldn't be any terror left on the world, right? Because once Satan and the beast that we're going to learn about and read about, and the false prophet that we're going to learn about and read about, and all those who refuse to accept Christ are thrown into the lake of fire, evil is annihilated from the earth. And once evil is annihilated, there's no, there's no terror, there's no fear, there's no nothing to be worried about because it's gone. It'll be in God's presence 24-7 if, they still, if we still keep time like that. Um... His doom is sealed, but he still has power at his disposal. We used to have a, church, a guy that came to church here a long time ago, and he was losing his marriage. His wife found somebody else. And he would tell me with tears in his eyes, with the most legit, I believe, attitude that he could possibly germ up, and he said, I would attack the gates of hell with a squirt gun if that's what it took to get her back. And I said, well, she's apparently already surrendered to whoever's behind the gates of hell. And if she doesn't want to come back, there's nothing you can do to get her back. And you can't prevail against the gates of hell. You have no, no idea how much power is there. Okay? Satan is not easily defeated. If you'll remember, when the disciples were out casting out demons, uh, and Paul was out doing that kind of stuff, there were seven Jewish ex um, yeah, people who cast out demons, exorcists, <laughs> and they went up to this guy, and they knew that he was demon-possessed, and they said, in the name of Jesus, and in the name of Paul, well, they were Jewish, and they didn't believe in Jesus, and they just heard Paul's name, we command you to leave this man. And he just looked at him and said, I know who Jesus is. And I know who Paul is. Who do you think you are? And it says that man beat all seven of them to the point where they were bloody and naked and ran away from him. Okay? When evil is present, there's the power there. But the power of God that we have and the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us is able to defeat that evil. Okay? Now, all our Pentecostal brothers and sisters out there who see a demon behind every bush and who are casting the demon of everything out of everybody, they don't understand that. They think they can just say magic words and it goes away. Well, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Um, so we, uh, we look at this and we say, why would God allow Satan to have power after he's already overthrown? Why? And then the last thing under verse 12 there. We know he's still got power because he attacks the church on earth intending to force them to deny their faith. Doesn't he? He's trying to do what he tried to do with Mrs. Job. Mrs. Job walked up to Job while he was sitting there in sackcloth and ashes, putting ashes on his head, scraping the boils that were on his body with little pieces of pottery while the dogs were licking it. And she said, why don't you just curse God and die? That was not Mrs. Job talking. That was Satan talking through her, some evil power talking through her. I'm sure she was mad because her kids were dead. Her comfortable life was gone. Her house was torn down. <laughs> Everything they had was gone. And she gave up on God if she ever believed in him in the first place, which she couldn't have, or she'd have never said, curse God and die. You see, we, we fail to miss those things. We miss that stuff all the time. We fail to see that. When somebody says, God won't, or when somebody says God can't, or when somebody says just walk away from God, he doesn't matter, there's no way they could possibly have a relationship with God. No way. No way, no way, no way. Because God never tempts us to sin. 
And to deny God exists is what? Sin. Surely it is. To, t- to tell somebody else to curse God and die is sin. God never tempts us to do that. That comes straight from evil. Evil's always existed, and evil has been there ever since Satan rebelled against God. Okay, let's look at verses 13 through 17, and we're going to see this war on earth that it's talking about. Remember in verse 12, it says, Terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger. Why is he angry? He's angry because he couldn't defeat God. He's angry because he couldn't destroy Jesus before he was born, or when he was born. He's angry because he didn't win at the cross, and he's angry because people still follow God. So there is nothing going on since time began that he's not angry about. Because every one of his plans has been thwarted by whom? God. God has thwarted every plan of evil. Okay? Here we go. Verse 13 through 17. When the dragon realized that he'd been thrown down to earth. Think about that. That's like laying in the bed and all of a sudden you feel yourself falling and you get that boom when you hit the ground. Anybody ever roll out of bed and hit the floor before? Yeah. It's not the falling that hurts. What is it? It's that sudden stop at the end, right? And so it's like Satan is asleep having a dream in heaven, and all of a sudden he wakes up and realizes he's on earth. What's that mean? He's cut off from access to God. He's cut off from his power source. He's cut off from a lot of stuff. It says, when the dragon realized that he'd been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who'd given birth to the male child. Who's that? That's the church right there. Remember the heavenly body? The woman who was pregnant that had 12 stars on her head? He was trying to kill that. That was the beginning. That was the spiritual body of the church. He came down and started waging war against the church, against God's people. Well, he'd been waging war against God's people ever since Adam. Correct? Wasn't Adam God's person? Didn't he worship God? Didn't he meet with God every day? Until sin separated them. Then God made a way for them to be reconciled because he sacrificed some animals. And then it says that Abel Abel became a follower of God and did what God wanted. Cain didn't. And then we find that as those two lines split, the ones who were of Cain fell further and further and further away from God. And the ones who came out of Abel's line didn't come out of Abel's line because Abel was dead. So God raised up another son named Seth. So now we have Canaan's line of evil, and we have Seth's line of good, but some point along the way, the people that belonged to Seth started marrying over with the people that belonged to Cain, and the sin affected the whole world. And God said, I'm sorry I ever made them. I'm going to destroy them all. And then he found Noah. He didn't know it. He didn't know it was there. He said, well, I'll save them again. And like I said this morning, I wonder how much more it's going to take in our world today. Has anybody seen the new Alexa commercial about the camp, the camper, the guy who's a camper? Oh my gosh. I wanted to throw my shoe through the TV when it came on today. There's a guy sitting there in a chair in woman's clothes with a scarf tied around his neck and he wants to go camping so he talks to Alexa about camping. And then at the very end he's dressed like a Boy Scout in one of the Boy Scout Smokey Bear hats, Boy Scout outfit, Talking about him. Which maybe he's going with Pete Buttigieg and his husband, I don't know. But that's commercial on TV right now. Yeah. You think Satan doesn't have some pull in the world right now? Yeah, he does. How bad does it have to be? How bad does it have to be? It says it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. We raise our kids up to be Christian kids and immediately go hang out with kids that aren't Christian kids. And it corrupts them. Because bad company corrupts good morals. That's why we've got to pump it into them. I've got to preach to them. I've got to talk to them. I've got to make sure that they get a steady diet of what it means to live for Christ. Because one day they're going to be tempted and they may choose to follow the temptation. But the Bible says if you raise a child up in the way that they should go when they're old, they won't pass from it. Here's the deal. They may not live for God, but they'll never be comfortable while they're not living for God. That's the piece that holds on that. Okay? And... Winston Churchill said it like this. If you're not a liberal when you're in your 20s, you're not compassionate. If you're not a conservative 
By the time you're in your 40s, you're stupid. Okay? Look at what's going on in the lives of our kids today. They're believing everything they're told. And they, they're just being... We were having that conversation in my house today about, well, how, how's this going to... It's what they're being forced into. Everybody's buying into political correctness. Political correctness started when Bill Clinton was the president. Look how far it's come since Bill Clinton was the president. It takes a village to raise a child. It doesn't take a family. And now we have groups that want to do away with the nuclear family altogether. Right? When you start with those little bitty ideas back here, by the time they get 20, 30 miles down the road, they're automatically changing our entire society. Aren't they? Yes. I mean, just look back over your lives and see what's changed in the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I was at college on Wednesday night talking to a couple students, and I said, I can remember the day when I said, I can remember 30 years ago, and now I can say I can remember 50 years ago. And I look over those 50 years and I say, oh my gosh. We have gone from the toilet to the septic tank in our world today. And I shared some of that with the guys when we had our men's dinner on Tuesday night. And one of the young men that was there, his dad said, well, he said, how come you didn't talk about anything positive? He missed the whole part where I was talking about we as men need to come together, support each other, and try to make a difference in our world. That was the positive thing. And the thing that I was saying we needed to be against was this and this and this and this is going on in our society. And all those things are very negative things. But the positive thing is when men come together to love their families and love their wives and do what we're supposed to do, this world could change. And he missed that piece. His dad had to help him understand that. So, you know, we, we see all kinds of stuff going on in the world today. Um, Satan resumes his attacks against God's people there in verse 13. And then in verse 14, but she was given two wings like those of a great eagle, so she could fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for what? Time, times, time, and half a time, or 1260 days, or three and a half years, or a limited amount of time. Right? Verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> Let me go on down 15 and 16. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with the flood of water that flowed from his mouth. But the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children. Listen to this. All who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. And the dragon took a stand on the shore beside the sea. Now, as we unpack 14 through 16, God continues to protect his bride from the dragon. Aren't we called the bride of Christ collectively as the church? Read Ephesians chapter 5. It says Christ sacrificed his life for his bride, the church, so that she could be presented to him without spot or wrinkle or blemish. And if you read a little bit once you get to the part of Revelation, it says there's going to be a great marriage feast between the Lamb and the church. When all evil is done and, and all those kinds of things are going on, we're going to be there with Christ. And again, John is spreading the hope for these people who are under all this severe persecution. Ultimate safety, even in the face of martyrdom, is what we're talking about here. Ultimate safety, even in the face of martyrdom. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus, what did I tell you? John's using a lot of Old Testament imagery, right? Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. It says this. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountainside and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob, announced to the descendants of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings. What does it say that the, what, that the woman was given? Eagles' wings. Okay? 
You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So there are places in the Bible where it says God gathers us like a mother chick hen, like and holds us like chicks under his wings. Okay? And then when we read Isaiah chapter 40, 31, it says he will raise us up on wings like eagles, bear us on the breath of God, right? And so we see that God gives us strength. God delivers us from evil. God delivers us from persecution. God delivers us from trouble. He's always there watching out for us who belong to him. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? And John is sharing the same thing with these people who are, some of them are being martyred at the time he's writing this. Rome has decided they want the church to be wiped out. Roman Catholicism did not start until 300 A.D. I was listening to a show the other day called Pints with Aquinas, and it's these Catholic guys talking about how there's an apostolic progression all the way through from when Jesus walked on the earth from Peter, and that's not true. It's not true at all. Um, the, the Catholic Church didn't come to be until Constantine in 300 A.D. had a dream that he was marching through the Crusades with a white shield with a red cross on it, and he believed, that because his mother was a believer, she told him that that meant Christ was going to bring him victory, so he declared himself a Christian, but he was a pagan before he became a Christian. He never accepted Christ, and every convert he made on the way, this is how he did it. He said, when he conquered a group of people, he got them on their knees, and he said, you either accept Jesus or you get your head cut off right now. That's how the Roman Catholic Church started. Didn't start because they were ancestors of Peter or a direct line of descendants from Peter, and nobody today is a direct descendant from Peter. Because they go in that building and they light the fire, and when, the, when they all agree and they do all their swapping and all their, their horse trading, and this one gets this and that one gets that, and this guy gets moved where he wants, then they send up the white smoke. And they say, look, God said. No, God didn't say. They decided. But that's, again, part of their tradi tradition, part of their lore, part of their mythology. <clears throat> right? That makes sense to everybody? Because <clears throat> Catholicism is really a mythological religion. You know what mythological is, right? It's my favorite Mostly made up. <laughs> what they do is mostly made up. It's drawn from pagan worship. Pagan worship from the 3rd century B.C., all the way up through to where Constantine was. When they talk about the mass, the sacrifice, originally they would take a cow and put it up here with a grate under it, and people who wanted to be baptized into that would walk under the cow as they were cutting the cow's throat, and the blood was running down through the grate. And the big carp hats, the big carp mouth hats they were, and the robes and all that, that comes straight from the mythological religions of Zoroastrianism, and, and Greek, Greek religion and things like that. They just adopted pagan religion and they put a Christian name to it. Because they don't believe you must be born again. They don't. Because every time I start talking to somebody who's Catholic, oh, you must be one of those born agains. You bet I am, I'm born again, because Jesus said you must be born again. Right? And people who bought into their mythology, they don't hear that, they don't believe that, they don't understand that because they've never heard it before. And the longer they've been in it, the harder it is for them to understand that. Just like the ones who grow up in Arminianism instead of Calvinism. Arminianists believe you can lose your salvation. There was a guy named Jacob Arminius who took Scripture and put them together in such a fashion that it looks like you can lose your salvation. Well, if I didn't gain my salvation and I didn't get it for myself, and the Bible says that salvation is a free gift from God, how can I lose that? Okay? But if you talk to somebody who believes you can lose your salvation... They say, well, you're one of those once saved, always saved. No. I believe in the security of the believer. Jesus said, of those that the Father gives me, I won't lose one. I'll raise them all up on the last day. Jesus gave me the faith to believe in him. He made the sacrifice for my salvation. He keeps me saved. Okay? So as we look at these things that are going on here, there is safety in the face of martyrdom. Here it says in, Re in Exodus that God carried them on eagles' wings as they came out of Egypt. How did he do that? Pillar of fire and cloud, right? 
pillar of fire to lead them in the daytime and a cloud behind them so that the Egyptians couldn't see where they were going. And then at night when they rested, the pillar of fire was where? At the tabernacle. To show God's presence. So the people were always aware of God's presence. And I believe that's one thing we've lost in our world today. That's why we need to sing that song when he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. Another song that I used to sing when I was young in the ministry that talks about God sitting on the park bench just waiting for you to come. Waiting for you to come. Right? I miss my time with you. Those moments together. You need to be with me each day. And it hurts me when you say you're too busy. Even busy trying to serve me, but how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? We don't practice the presence of Christ. We don't think enough as a, co a cooperative of people that God is everywhere present all the time. Nothing happens that he doesn't know about it. And you know, if we start looking at things like I was describing this morning as divine appointments, it's not just accidents that that fella came into your shop the other day right before I got there so that you could share with him what you shared with him, both of you. You know? It's not an accident that those kind of things happen. God gave that an appointment. And so we have the opportunity to let God work in our lives and He'll protect us. And ultimately, like I said, if it costs us our life, it does not cost us our soul and our spirit. It can't. Because God protects us even in the midst of death. All right, here we go again. Time, times, and half the time. 1,260 days, 42 months. But what this is, is the last terrible period of persecution and terror. This last period is when Satan knows it's really getting short. He's cast down. He knows his time's coming. He knows he's going to end up in the lake of fire. Even though he believes he's going to be able to overcome God somehow or another, he knows inside somehow or another that it's not going to happen. That it's going to happen. And then in verse 17, it says, The dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. What do I tell everybody that decides they're going to step up and either give their life to Christ, give their life back to Christ, or start serving Christ at a different level? What do I tell everybody? Get ready. Get ready. Why get ready? Because you just became Satan's enemy. When you're doing nothing for God, you are not Satan's enemy. But when you decide to do what God wants, you automatically become his enemy. And his plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He will steal from you. He will kill anybody that he can or kill any of your dreams that he can and he'll try to ruin you as a person. Or if he can't get you, he will use your children against you. He will use other friends against you. He will use your job against you. He will use any circumstance that he can scrounge up to use against you to cause you to stumble and fall. Okay? But we have to resist. And we have to trust. Finishing up here. The church is not vulnerable as a whole. The woman. Okay, but individual witnesses, her children, can be martyred. Let's look at Luke chapter 21, verses 8 through 18. Luke chapter 21. And we're going to focus specifically on verses 12 through 18. But I hate coming in in the middle of a passage. I'm going to read the whole passage. All right, Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 8. <coughs> Luke 21, starting in verse 8. Well, here, let's go back to verse 7 where the question is answered. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? Well, Luke 21 is the same as Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Okay. Jesus is telling what's going to happen at the end. And then verse 8, it says, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Messiah, and saying the time has come. But don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. 
Then he added, nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things, and great miraculous signs from heaven. We've already read about some of those, right? In chapter 6 and chapter 7, um, chapter 12, chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 10, as we've been going through the book of Revelation. But before all this occurs, watch this, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into the synagogues and prisons. You will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. What did Jesus say when they're taking you to the death? Keep talking about me. Didn't Paul do that? He sure did. Paul talked to every governor, Felix, and, and everybody else that was getting ready to put him away. And he talked to him. And he tried to tell them who Jesus was and what was going on. Um, he so don't worry in advance about how to answer these charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Do you hear that? Well, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know how to respond to that. What did Jesus just say? I'll put the words there and it'll stun them. They won't even know how to respond. Okay? Even those closest to you, your parents, your brothers, your relatives and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers. If there's no one that hates you, are you living your life in front of Christ? If there's no one who just can't decide they want to be around you ever again, are you really living your testimony? Because the Bible says we can't be friends with the world and friends with God at the same time. The two don't go together. <clears throat> Not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? The church as a whole is never going to go away. But individual believers come under attack every day. Right? And what I said this morning about the church under persecution, it grows. The church under persecution grows. Do you know why we've become so fat and lazy in the Western world, including Europe and Canada and the United States? Because it's been pretty easy. And you know, people aren't being forced to turn from God. They're walking away willingly. They're walking away from the church willingly. They don't want to be around God. God puts too much of a cramp in their side. It's boring to be a Christian. It's awful to be a Christian. Christians are the people who are against everything, aren't they? No, we're just against sin and anything that leads people to sin. Every time I see that commercial from the University of Maryland about gambling, it makes me want to throw up. You know, gambling is fun. But gambling, you've got to make sure you know how much you're going to spend, you've got to know what your limit is, and don't mix gambling with drugs or alcohol. Like everybody's just going to listen to that and say, okay... What do they do in Maryland? They continue to make it easier and easier and easier and easier for people to gamble. Now you can gamble on college ball games. You can gamble on fights. You can gamble on anything you want to gamble. You can go to Rocky Gap. Only got to be 21. They don't care whether you got money in your bank account or not. They'll even give you 50 bucks to start gambling with. Because you know why? Most people, once they get into it, don't even really pay attention and they don't look and they don't know when to stop and when they do stop they find out that they're in trouble. Don't they? So the devil is always sneaky about how he tries to ruin individuals. Alright, watch this. The dragon steps aside to call forth the beast from the abyss who will be his primary instrument of evil and persecution in regards to God's people and we're going to see that in next when we start in verse chapter 13. The dragon steps aside, calls forth the beast from the abyss, and will be his primary instrument of evil and persecution in regards to God's people. What was the first one there? Witnesses. Witnesses. The yep. Church. The church is not vulnerable as a whole, no, but individual witnesses. The very first one. Verse 17. The struggle between the church and the Antichrist gets real. The struggle between the church and the Antichrist gets real. That was Shadows verse 17 where it said, 
The dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Okay? Satan hates us. He hates that we're doing this. And the people are watching it on Facebook. And you're hearing it here. And somebody else is going to watch it on Facebook because somebody else recommends them to watch it on Facebook. He hates that. You know why? Because God's truth is going out. And God's word always accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. And it changes people's lives. And Satan hates that more than anything in the world. So why wouldn't he attack us? Why wouldn't he want to try to sideline us and stop us from sharing the good news? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I hope that I'm always allowed to be a part of the remnant. Because I am not going to compromise on the truth of God's word ever. Never. I don't care what anybody likes or they don't like. And you know, I look at it this way. I figured this out a long time ago. When they reject, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God's truth. Now, of course, some people look at me and automatically discount me because of the way I look. <laughs> right? Well, he couldn't know much. He just a dumb old hillbilly. Right? Looks like he belongs on Duck Dynasty. I've had several people say, Do you mean ZZ Top or are you one of the one of the one of Phil's boys? You know? I said, no, just me. And that's the sad thing. I don't have to wear a ten thousand dollar suit and five hundred dollar shoes and get my hair cut for a hundred dollars at the shop to be able to stand up and share God's word. And you don't have to have the degrees that I have to stand up and share God's word. You just gotta have willingness. God doesn't care about your abilities. He cares about your availability. Does that make sense? God doesn't care about your abilities. What did he tell them? He said, I'll put the words in your mouth. When they drag you before the kings and the rulers and the magistrates, I'll put the words in your mouth so you can tell them about me. The day is not here in the United States for that. But I'm telling you what, the way things are going, I don't think it's far off. I think I'll see it in my lifetime. I really do. When we can have leaders in our country who believe that they're good religious people in good standing with their church, but they want unfettered abortion, and they're promoting the LGBTQ plus agenda, they're leading people straight to hell and opening the door and holding it for them. Yeah. They are. But they're being nice. But they're just being nice, yeah. It's better to be nice than to tell the truth. Well, guess what? I guess I'm not very nice. <laughs> I'm not very nice. But I'd rather defend somebody so they have to look and see who they are and find Christ than to know that I was the one who the ones who was standing there holding the door open for them while they were falling on their way to hell. Right? Yeah. Well, let's pray. We'll let you guys out here. Thank you for your patience tonight. Uh, thank you for your participation. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this word that we're reading that helps us to know that one of these days, it's going to get so bad that even the people who live for you are going to have to rely on you for the words to say as we're dragged before those who would try to stop, who are under the influence of evil. And Father, it just seems that everywhere in our world, nobody wants to hear your side of the story. Nobody wants to listen to you. We have young people, more and more young people, that are brought up with no, no understanding of the Bible, no understanding of who you are, your holiness, your righteousness. We have people who decided they wanted to try at some time when their life was all out of whack and they thought you were just the problem solver and the fixer and then once you helped them or it didn't go their way, they just turned their back on you and they walk away, whether it's good or bad. But Father, I pray that we would be a remnant, that we would be a shining light on the hill, that when people meet us here at Cumberland Community Church, when they come to be a part of the service, when they, when they watch on the videos, when they listen to it on the podcast, when they hear me on the radio, I pray that your word would reach people's hearts and their minds, that you would turn them back to you, Father, and turn others who've never met you towards you. We're not the Holy Spirit. We can't convict anybody. We can't manipulate anybody. And if we're doing the manipulating, they're not coming to you. They're just being manipulated. So, Father, we ask that your will would be accomplished in our lives and that we would be faithful witnesses to you as evil begins to ratchet up in our world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.